Hey guys, this is Max Headspace 9mm, and the subject today is machine guns. And in talking about machine guns, we're going to cover NFA items. Uh, I've learned a lot about this subject over the years, but I am not foolproof. Um, the purpose today, I'm just going to speak extemporaneously about what I've learned in the process of getting NFA items. There's a lot of confusion about it. I um, I think I can help smooth the skids a little bit for you if you're considering making a decision like that. So over the years, what I have done is I've gotten three suppressors, an SBR, and a machine gun. Those are all NFA items, uh, National Firearms Act regulated by the ATF. Now, a little history, um, you know, when our country was founded, we had the Second Amendment and it speaks very clearly about our rights. So why do we have this system that we have right now? Well, I don't want to get too deep into politics, but basically it's the difference of opinion between uh, two phrases in the Second Amendment, in my opinion. One is uh, well-regulated militia. People on one side of the argument believe that means the government has the right to create regulations to structure what kind of weapons we're allowed to have as citizens. And then the other part is, shall not be infringed. And then that's pretty much a blanket statement that makes it very, very clear the government is not to infringe our rights. Well, how do you do both of those at the same time? Well. That seems to leave, in some people's mind, the door open for debate on the topic because those, well, the first sentence, well-regulated, is open to interpretation. The second, shall not be infringed, is not. So I have my opinions about it. I'm not going to go there today, but feel free. If you want to weigh in on this in the comments section, I would love to talk with you about it. I read every comment and I comment on most of them if there's anything I have to offer. So what happened was in the founding years, in the early years of our country, we citizens were allowed to have anything. Citizens own cannon, they own high explosives, they own as many firearms as they want, wanted, there was really nothing to stop them from getting a weapon of any kind at that time. Which is a much different story than what we're being told by our current president, who said that they didn't have the right to have those things. But they did, historically. Plantations had cannons to protect their property. Uh, ships were largely owned by private individuals and they were equipped with cannons. Um, so, I mean, it's pretty easy to prove citizens owned just about every kind of weapon that was available at the time. Now weapons technology has come a long way since then and some people are really scared by it because they watch movies and they see video games and things are sort of exaggerated in those contexts and you know I mean they're not very realistic to be honest. Uh, most movies uh, you never see a mag change. People just shoot endlessly out of uh, some bullet hose that's magically there. And, and so a lot of people get this mistaken idea that when you have a machine gun that you're out to kill people because that's all they see in the movies portrayed and that you're gonna be able to endlessly spray as many bullets as exist on planet Earth and without ever having to stop and change magazines or anything. And so it's pretty easy to convince people that are ignorant about the subject that we need a lot of laws to highly regulate these things. But the truth of the matter is it's actually not that hard to get machine guns. A little bit more about that later. So in the 30s, as a result of um, alcohol being outlawed for sale, consumption, and manufacture, uh, prohibition, there was a gangster era in the United States and gangs would fight over territories and over commodities of alcohol. There's a lot of uh, inner city fighting, just as there is right now. Gangs fight today over drug turf. And so we have the same problem, it hasn't really changed. But in the 30s, just before 
the government started regulating full auto firearms and so forth, began this process, you could go into a hardware store and you could buy a Thompson machine gun, you could buy a Browning automatic rifle, you could buy a shotgun and cut the barrel to any length that you wanted without any regulation or oversight by the government whatsoever. People did that. Well, once they started um, making these regulations, um, all of a sudden people had to pay extra fees to have these items or to alter them. And so it's been that way pretty much ever since, except with the exception in 1986, you could up to that point buy a machine gun and pay the $200 tax stamp. And interestingly enough, that fee of $200, whereas in the 30s, probably was greater than the cost of the actual weapon itself, that fee has not increased at all. So now it's a fairly small fee comparatively to the actual firearm that you're buying, even though it's a lot more than a background check fee. And so in 1986, we had a new development. President Ronald Reagan signed into law the National Firearms Protection Act and it made any machine gun manufactured after that date illegal to own by citizens. The only machine guns at that point that could still be owned and bought and sold legally were ones that are currently in existence. So what that set up was a commodity system. Uh, something that is not going to increase in number at all from that point forward and would only diminish. I mean, you know, every year so many firearms are completely destroyed in fires and catastrophes and who knows what, or stolen, and some of these slip away from us. So the number is actually slowly diminishing over time of these firearms that existed prior to 1986. So there's a limited quantity that is slowly decreasing over time. What that does is it makes firearms of that nature, full auto firearms, um, very valuable as an investment. And uh, I'll cover that a little bit more later. So in 1986, this all started. From that point forward, machine guns started steadily increasing in price and value. And even though the government may not have realized that was the effect that this was gonna have, it became quite a um, commodity to invest in. Even though the parts that make the difference between, for example, an AR-15 and an M-16 are just a couple of little tiny pieces of steel shaped a certain way that really don't cost more than a few bucks to manufacture, the difference that they make in the capability of that firearm and the collectability is enormous. So, you've seen in the last couple of videos that I've produced, this is the machine gun that I bought. Now, when I first bought this, it had a different upper receiver. This is the upper receiver that came with the machine gun. What I bought was an M16 Commando. Now, an M16 Commando was developed Oh, about, I think, in the Vietnam era. And it was just like the regular M16 with the 20-inch barrel, except this one was shortened down to about 10 and a half inches. Why did they do that? Well, one of the biggest complaints that the uh, soldiers had was that the barrel was so long in the thick jungles that it was difficult to get around without getting tangled up. It was a longer gun, the M16, with its 20-inch barrel, than the AK-47. And that was one of the main complaints. They also said it was underpowered and a variety of different things, but, but you know, there's not much that could be done about that when you decide on shooting the 223 round, as, as the round the gun is designed to use. So what they did was the government came up with the M16 Commando which is a smaller version of the M16 with a shortened barrel to 10 and a half inches, I believe it is. And what this does is it gives you a lot more 
capability when it comes to getting in and out of vehicles, entering buildings, and fighting in really close quarters. Uh, fighting on ships is another thing. When you uh, have pirates boarding ships or when you have entry teams um, fighting on a ship, the quarters are very close and tight and navigating around sharp bends and so forth becomes much easier with a much shorter barrel. You're not interested in long range shooting anymore, so the long barrel is not much of a factor that concerns you. You want something quick and mobile and, and easy. And so that's where the M16 began. Now years later, the military, you know, tweaked the design numerous times, and we wound up with something kind of like this for today's military. This is what's called a Mark 18. Mark 18 has basically the same lower, almost no changes whatsoever to it, but it has an upper, even though the barrel is the same, the upper receiver has a quad rail so that you can fit all kinds of flashlights, tactical gear, infrared, night vision, lasers, you know, anything you could want. Um, it's a flat top instead of a carry handle. And the reason for the flat top is it gives you a greater ability to put optics onto the gun. And, you know, just a variety of different little things that they did to make the Mark 18. Now, the Mark 18 is the firearm that, as we all know, famously, supposedly, uh, dispatched um, Osama bin Laden. Um, that's what entry teams and Navy SEALs and so forth use today, is the Mark 18. Very little practical difference between the M16 Commando and the Mark 18. Just a few modernizations to make it easier and more adaptable. So why did I get this? You know, there's a lot of different decisions that you have to make when you are deciding on a machine gun. It was a lot easier for me because I started out getting suppressors in the beginning. The process for getting a suppressor is exactly the same process as for getting a machine gun. So why this great mystique and hype about machine guns? Well, that's what I'm here to dispel today. Basically, if you can go into a gun store and pass a background check, you already qualify to own a machine gun. A lot of the public, I think, has this mistaken understanding that machine guns are highly regulated and impossible to get and civilians can't have them, and, and I think the government probably prefers we think that. But it's not the truth. The truth is that if you can pass a background check and get a pistol, a hunting rifle, a shotgun, anything else, you already qualify to get a machine gun. So it's no different as far as qualific qualifications are concerned. The difference is the wait time and the price of the tax stamp. Now, when I got my first suppressor, I waited about six months for my background check paperwork to pass and to get my tax stamp. Tax stamp is some papers that you get in a big envelope, big manila envelope, and they're too big and too valuable <laughs> to carry around with you everywhere you want to go where you might be taking this suppressor. So what I did was I created a little version of it, a really good uh, precise copy with really good resolution that you can zoom in with the camera on your phone and, and read every word on this, and then I laminated it. So that's a good thing that you can do because this is much easier to carry around with your suppressor than some sheets of paper. Also, you don't want to lose those sheets of paper because if you do, you pretty much have to hand over the item that gives you that, that you got the sheets of paper in order to own. So um, it's very important you keep those in the safe and keep some facsimile with you. Now, everything's changed since then, so I'm going to tell you about those changes. My first tax stamp took about six months for me to get. Filled out forms that are very, very much like a regular background check, sent them in, and waited. My second tax stamp took about eight months for me to get. My third tax stamp took about nine months for me to get. 
And then I decided I want to do an SBR build. So I built my um, PS90. And I have some videos on my channel about that. Now that one took a year. And partly it was because the ATF actually made a mistake. They said it was my fault, but it wasn't. And I can prove it. But they said I made a mistake and I didn't give them the right numbers for something or they didn't have the right numbers that I supplied. And so I went quite a while and I was getting a little nervous and I actually called a phone number of somebody who worked for the ATF and they told me that uh, I was timed out and that I had to re-apply um, for that SBR tax stamp. So I filled out the paperwork again and I sent it off. So all things being considered, it took me about a year to get my SBR tax stamp. And then when I decided I wanted to go for the Grand Poobah, the Mount Everest of firearms, the thing that I'd always dreamed of having, a machine gun to call my own, the most fun firearm you could possibly have, I was nervous but I'd been through this before, so it was no big deal. I went ahead and filled out the same forms. This was back before e-file, so I filled out the actual forms, and um, I sent them in, and I got very, very nervous because waiting for my tax stamp to come back for the machine gun took 16 months, 16 months. And I was nervous. I, I thought maybe they'd lost things. I, I thought maybe there was a problem. And I looked up the phone number to call, and I would call and call and call. And I was there listening to annoying music, elevator music. I don't know how many hours I sat listening to that. Um, but nobody would ever answer. Well, it turns out I heard that the ATF had a historically long backlog. And that was just before they went to the e-file system. And I haven't used the e-file system yet, but it should be much quicker now. I'm hoping that that solved the problem for people. So after 16 months, I finally got my tax stamp and I went down to the gun store that had this in their safe and I paid the balance for it and I took it home just that quick. So um, I got to tell you, it's one of the greatest things that I've ever enjoyed. I, I, I don't think a lot of people would really understand this. Either you get it or you don't. Owning a machine gun is probably one of the most satisfying and exciting thrills of my entire life. It pushes all the buttons. And just throwing in a magazine and, and shooting off, you know, so many rounds in, in a second or two, it just adjusts my attitude and I smile and I go on my way. It's therapy for me. And people spend a whole lot more money on their vices than that. So. Yes, it is kind of a waste of money, but it is an investment. And the reason why it's an investment is there, as I said before, only so many of these in existence, the price is only going up. So interesting thing, from the time I bought this gun to the time I got my, my tax stamp back, 16 months, it had gone up in value $7,000. Now, I just checked before I made this video what these are going for online at the auction houses. It's gone up about another $10,000. And, and if, you, if you don't think I'm telling the truth, you check it out for yourself. The price of machine guns is going nuts. Will it come back down? It may. I don't know. But I think the reason they're going nuts right now is because people are looking for better investments than what they're seeing in the stock market, which is not doing so great right now. Our economy is not very good. People are looking for places to store value. And there aren't a lot of things in this world right now that are secure. This is secure. The only thing that make this not secure is if the government all of a sudden decided to do away with it and make machine guns legal for civilians again of new manufacture. And I really highly doubt they're going to do that. I hope they do. I'd be happy if they did. But I really don't think they will. So um, I'm enjoying my investment. I can go out and use it. 
by putting this upper receiver on here. This, this is a different upper receiver off of a SIG. And you know, as a AR-15, it's very easy to swap receivers. Push a couple pins out, pop it on there, and, and you're good. It's no mystery at all. That's the, the design of the weapon. The uh, serial number is in the lower receiver. That you can put any upper you want on there. And because what I got was a short-barreled rifle, it's already an SBR. And so I don't need an SBR tax stamp for that. I can put any length barrel I want on it. I can put um, barrels for, uh, make it into a sub gun if I want to put a receiver, uh, uh, receiver converter adapter in the magwell. I can, I can basically shoot a whole lot of different uh, calibers through this, 300 Blackout, um, 458 SOCOM, I mean, 50 Beowulf, you know. Um, and that is what I wanna talk about to you next. How do you choose what kind of a machine gun to get? First of all, be very careful when you're looking at online auction houses or gun stores or so forth. You might find a machine gun for a price that you think is too good to be true. But look out for terms like no law letter or um, post sample. Those are not legal for civilians to have. Those are only if you have special privilege, if you have a special license. If you are a dealer, you're in the business of dealing in these firearms, and that's a whole different kind of thing you have to apply for. You have to make a business out of it. Or if you are part of a SWAT team or some kind of a military detail or security team or work for the government, you can get those kind of regulations waived and, and have a, uh, a license to own those kind of firearms. But as soon as you stop doing that and you don't qualify anymore, you have to give that thing back or sell it. So stay away from the no law letter guns or the um, post samples. Those are not civilian legal guns. And that is why they're so cheap. Now the ones that you want are called machine guns. And make sure to ask the right questions. Make sure this is a civilian legal machine gun. Chances are you'll know because they're all the really expensive ones. And they're expensive because there's only so many and those are the ones that are investments. So why did I pick this one? What is it about this particular gun that made me want it? There's a lot of cheaper options out there. If you want a machine gun, you don't have to pay for something like this because this is not the most expensive, but it's far from the least expensive. If you want an entry level machine gun, you could get something like an Uzi or a Mac 10. Those would be really good, a lot of fun. Open bolt um, machine guns, uh, sub guns basically. Really cool, really cool. And there's a lot of them out there and parts are available. They're very durable. About the only thing you're ever gonna break on it is a spring. And you can pretty much get any part you need to repair and maintain those guns. And they're like about a third the cost of this gun. So they would be a good way to get your feet wet in machine guns. Um, if, if you're kind of on a budget and you only can justify so much money to get into it. They're not going up in value nearly as quickly either. The reason why this gun was so perfect for me and why I held out for it, and I saved for years to get this, is the AR-15 or M16 platform is incredibly adaptable. And that makes it an incredibly good investment. This gun can be many different guns. As I said before, uh, you can put any kind of optic you want on there. You can put any kind of upper receiver you want on here. You don't have to worry about wearing it out because it's the upper, upper receiver that gets all the wear. So I have a piston upper on here and it's perfect for full auto fire because all the dirt is contained up here where the piston is. It's not back here in the bolt. So this thing will run a really long time between cleanings. It doesn't come up, it's not hard to clean, and it runs relatively cool because it's not running a bunch of hot gases, hot carbony gases back into 
the bolt and the bolt face. So that is uh, why I think this is one of the best machine guns you could get. Now, the thing about the M16 platform is, I mentioned before, it's adaptable. You could put any upper receiver you want on there. The last thing in the world you want is to break your machine gun. Yes, they can be fixed most of the time, um, but because all of the wear parts can be removed and replaced on M16s and AR-15s, uh, because it's the barrel and the bolt and the parts that you know do all the work, you don't have as much risk with this thing. I took off the upper receiver that came with it and I don't shoot through this. This has very, very low rounds through it. No, I put all the rounds through this other upper receiver and I've got more of them so I can just put on more if I wear it out. I don't think I will. I don't have that many rounds, but I, I, I could. I can have a lot of fun with this before it's ever gonna wear out or blow up. So um, choosing the gun has a lot to do with how good of an investment do you want this to be? Are you just gonna lock it in your safe and never use it? Or do you wanna get it out and have fun? I wanted to actually be able to use it. And part of the reason why this is so desirable of a firearm is exactly that. A lot of people realize that a short barreled rifle like this in the M16 or AR-15 platform is going to be the Mount Everest of, of firearms as far as what you can do with it. You can shoot any caliber around you want through it that'll fit in this magwell. And it's adaptable and it's safe because you don't have to worry about blowing your receiver apart. There's some really good machine guns um, that you can get that are kind of in between this. And I could go in listing them. I don't, I don't really want to do that. If you want to talk about it in the comments section, I'll be happy to give you any advice if you see something that you're interested in. But bottom line, look for something where there are plenty of parts available to fix anything that might go wrong. Don't get something that's really odd, that shoots an odd caliber, um, that's really hard to get parts for. Don't get something with really low magazine capacity because that's not fun. Um, and also, you know, I, just my personal opinion. Personally, I think that the Tommy gun is way overpriced. They're very cool and iconic. Um, they're beautiful, they're pieces of art in a, in a way, but extremely limited on what they can do. And they're usually going for more than I paid for this M16 Commando. Um, I don't know why exactly, I think because they have that iconic look basically. But they are limited to the 45 round, which is a lot more expensive than the 223 or 556. Their capacity is more limited. They're very heavy, and I just think they're way, way, way overpriced for what they are. But there's a lot of them out there, and a lot of people like them. And if that's what turns your crank, then go, go for it. I, everybody knows what it is that they really like and what gets them excited, and that's what you should go for. This is what gets me excited. You should go for what gets you excited. So I think... Um, this is a long enough video, I've probably exhausted the subject. And I've mentioned everything that's come to mind as far as what I've learned in the process of getting a machine gun. I do not regret it. I don't think I ever will regret it. I could turn around and sell this for, you know, a third more than I paid for it right now, easily. And um, it's just a wonderful thing. I, I literally have stopped wanting guns after this. There's nothing Nothing out there in the world of guns that excites me more than this. I, I've found it. So um, if you can relate to that, you might want to consider um, beginning to plant the seed in your mind about having a machine gun of your own. It is a investment, you know, but many people can find a way to buy a car that costs much more than this. Um, I know cars are kind of a necessity but um, they're not really a very good investment. So just think long-term, think about the things that really matter in your life. Now, when it comes to leaving this to an heir, that's a little bit of a problem. You have to have 
kind of some extra NFA, you know, regulations, hurdles to go through. And sometimes that helps to have a lawyer guide you through that. If you have one of these and you want to will it to somebody, um, that's a process, but it can be done. Definitely can be done. So um, again, let's continue this in the comment section. If you have any questions that I did not cover, um, fire away. I'll be happy to guide you through it. And I hope you enjoy this video. Hope you learned something. And I will uh, promise you, look forward to more videos in the future of me shooting this in different forms. One thing that I want to do, and I haven't done yet, probably one of the next videos I'm going to work on, is how it works this way with a suppressor. It definitely does. In fact, that's the way a lot of the uh, SEAL teams and entry teams use them because they're shooting in close quarters and, and the suppressor actually, even though it lengthens the barrel of the gun um, and makes it bigger, it still makes uh, sound less of a thing that's a problem or flash is another thing. So uh, maybe, do, maybe I'll do a little night shooting and so show you the difference in flash between with and without a suppressor and do some shooting with and without and show you the difference in sound because this is a supersonic round and so it is loud but it is less loud so um, look forward to that as well and thank you for your patience it's been a long time since i've uploaded videos with any regularity and that's partly because i've just been having fun with this gun and uh, learning about it and uh, we've all been going through a lot of life changes lately and um, it's changed a lot of people's perspective has mine too so I wish you well and fire away in the comment section. This is Max Headspace 9mm. Have a good one.